So my name is Clemens Akshak and I work at the University of Hamburg. Uh, we provided the general idea for this mission. The Italian partners are in charge of the main hardware and Slovenian partners for the mission payload. Before we go any further, I would like you to listen to the following audio. It's a conversation between uh, okay, the pilot and the traffic control. We have yeah, flight on the rest. We are in a fall. I guess nobody wants to hear something like this. But the crew managed to land this plane safely. So this wasn't a good thing. Okay, you have this side on the uh, ash. So this wasn't the first encounter of an airplane with volcanic ash. It happened already before. So but it was the but it was the one encounter that made uh, changing regulations. In the last fifty years there were more than hundreds of encounters like this. More than 20 of them led into severe uh, airplane damage, and in nine cases, there were, it resulted also in the total failure of the engines. The last such event happened not really so long ago, and as you can see, something like this can happen even a thousand kilometers away from volcano. It doesn't also last really long; it can last only two minutes of flying through the ash that an engine fails. So, the international community decided to uh, organize so-called volcanic ash advisory centers that provide such plots to the pilots as you can see over here. The left above the panel is based on observations and the others are predictions made for 6, 12, 15 hours ahead. So, predictions are made by the computer models. We need those to optimize the air traffic safety and reduce the costs of the airlines. Nobody wants to hear something, to see something like this, stranded passengers in the airports, as you can see over here. But it did happen in 2010. So why did airlines lose 1.3 billion euros in just six days? Why? We have really sophisticated models for air dispersion but they perform well only if we give them also good data. And the most important data for such a dispersion model is the height of the ash plane. Now, I will show you two results of the model. The first one is initiated with a height of seven kilometers, and you can see over here, just one kilometer lower uh, plume was dispersed in totally other direction. Why? Because the wind can change within the elevation of only 500 meters completely. So, we need to observe the top cloud height. We usually do this using satellites. The most common method for this is uh, based on brightness temperature measurements. If we know the emissivity of the cloud, if the cloud is in the thermal equilibrium with the rest of the atmosphere, if we have such an atmospheric profile, and if the cloud is under the tropopause, 
then this is possible to convert the temperatures into the heights. But there are too many ifs for a really successful estimation. So another alternative is called photogrammetry. There have been some instruments before that carry multiple cameras looking into uh, Nadir, a backward view, and a forward view. We can use them, and if you can just l concentrate on the area between those lines, you can see the ash bloom is shifted. This is because it is elevated and it is used from different positions. These shifts, these parallax, are used to estimate the cloud height. How? If this is the ash, uh, we can observe it with one satellite in a near view. A few minutes later, let's say from backward view, and there is a difference between the position in these clouds. It's called science parallax. This parallax can be used to compute the height. It's basically just the intersection of these two lines. But we are ignoring one point over here. The clouds can move. So we don't really observe this parallax over there. We observe this one. This one means that we observe also the false height. In this extreme case, it's actually just a depth, not a height. So we cannot really use one single satellite. We need to have simultaneous observations from at least two satellites. And for that, we cannot really use classical satellites. They're way too expensive. We need simultaneous observation from two macro satellites. This is the point of our cloud height mission. So what are the mission objectives? Obviously, aviation safety and cost reduction at the same time. For this, we would need uh, approximately 200 meter vertical accuracy, uh, 150 uh, meter horizontal resolution, at least once per day revisit time. And on demand, it would be nice to have uh, five images, five data sets within one minute. But I would like to stress something. So far, I have been concentrating only on the uh, ash cloud, but the same methodology can be used as well for observing meteorological or also some other aerosol clouds. Why is this important? There are some storm clouds, and their height is well correlated with the occurrence of severe weather like hail or tornadoes. So if we have high cloud, it is quite likely that there might be also a tornado coming. And these data are then, of course, interesting also for some other authorities, not just air traffic, although air traffic wouldn't like to send an airplane through such a cloud as well. So some facts. We need, obviously, at least two satellites flying information. They should observe simultaneously the same area on the Earth. We should have a resolution of 300 meters in the visible spectrum or 1,500 meter resolution in the thermal spectrum. How does this work? So after the launch, it is the key point to put both satellites into the formation as soon as possible. This is a maneuver control from the ground. And afterwards, the ground station actually just received the data. The satellite performed the stereoscopic observation. This is the concept of the formation. We have basically two identical satellites. Uh, in ideal case, they would carry two cameras, one operating in the visible infrared and the other one operating in thermal infrared. This would allow us stereoscopic observation of uh, in the visible spectrum under the first satellite and thermal stereoscopy under the second satellite. Uh, this gives us a good spatial resolution during daytime and also some valuable data during the nighttime. We have already chosen uh, the, a good sensor for the visible spectrum 
it results then also in approximately 1,200 kilometer uh, swath. Uh, for the thermal infrared sensor, we are still ch choosing. Uh, the mission needs obviously also a global navigation system, uh, satellite system receiver to accurately know the position of the satellite. The beauty of this mission is so uh, we don't really any special hardware. This is more or less all the commercial payload and uh, we assume that the total weight of the satellite will be less than 30 kilos. It will contain a system for orientation, proportion to set up the formation flying and also post-mission disposal. We, uh, we expect uh, the peak consumption of 22 watts and here you can see also the price of a satellite. The communication, margin of the link budget using s is positive. So this means that we can expect reliable data transmission. For near real-time monitoring, we would need at least six ground stations. And we expect to have 300 megabytes of data per orbit. Here you see the global distribution of volcanoes, red dots, and uh, some recent eruptions that caused uh, some major disturbances in global air traffic, so disturbances of for a week or so in the last years. As you can see, most of the problematic volcanoes and also the most uh, airline routes are positioned in the mid-latitudes. That's why we decided for a pretty inclined orbit of 60 degrees. What you see over here is a plot of daily coverage with a conservative um, swath of only 600 kilometers, which is half less as specified before. But if we had two constellations, we wouldn't just get the coverage once per day in the mid-latitudes. We would probably get three of them and the total global coverage from any place on the Earth. Risks I will just go to the last one. What happens if one satellite fails in the orbit? We were thinking of that and the best idea would be to have three and not just two satellites flying in a uh, constellation. So in case one fails, we still have two that perform stereoscopic observations. This obviously increases the project uh, cost, but it can be done. So, in the end, I would like to stress that already, although we, we have a mission plan already, this is still a concept. It's just an idea how to make the air traffic a little bit safer, cost effective. But in any case, we think we can finish it within two years because, as I said, it's all about commercial components. We don't really have to develop really some uh, new components. So this is it. If you have any further questions, you can contact me per email, or you can perhaps take a look at some of my previous work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So you basically use the means of photogrammetry to Exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> the resolution you want to achieve is pretty low, 300 meter. But uh, anyhow, it gives some requirements to the attitude and position accuracy you have on board of the satellites, of the different satellites. What, what are your, your solutions out of that calculation? Um, I'm not really sure. The, the position and attitude yeah accuracy on board, what, what kind of uh, 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 angular accu accuracy and, and position accuracy you need to have to, uh, to achieve this 300 meter height, cloud height uh, 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 precision? Well, the key point over here is that we have to have some kind of overlap between two satellites. 
we don't really need to have the perfect overlap. In that case, if we would just have one pixel, we could do the photogrammetry then only for one pixel. But here we are counting on, uh, with a sensor having 4,000 pixels in a row. So in that case, it's not such a disaster if only, let's say, 300, 3,000 pixels overlap and we have 1,000 on a side. This means we don't have the optimal coverage we can still provide some data for the swath in between. So this accuracy is not of such the highest importance. We can always pro provide some data, even with a really low accuracy of uh, positioning, we can provide the data. Yeah, but it depends on the base lengths you can use. Sorry? It depends on the base lengths you can use. Yes, that's true. Uh, we are counting on the baseline of about 400 kilometers by the height of 600 kilometers. So uh, this shouldn't be really a problem. Okay, so uh, I'm in, in interested in the uh, orbital. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm interested in orbital uh, arrangement uh, for the formation flying. So uh, maybe uh, the important thing is to keep the really, uh, distance between the two satellites almost the same distance as all, almost all the time. So uh, you have uh, some special orbit to achieve that? Uh, we don't have a special orbit to achieve that, but um, it's actually a really similar answer to the question before. We just have to have some kind of overlap. It is obviously that perfect overlap would uh, result in more data. But if the mission takes, let's say, 10 years and the orbit somehow de degrades, uh, so we don't have the perfect coverage anymore, we will in any case have some coverage. And uh, using some other techniques, I mean, we could use that part of the, the coverage just to calibrate the rest of the data because there are also some other techniques like photo inclinometry for the uh, visible uh, part of the sensor or the or let's say just that brightness temperature uh, heights that we can use for thermal uh, spectrum we need to have at least a part of the uh, part of the images being covered so being seen from both satellites and it doesn't really matter if uh, there is some degradation of the orbit w during the time. Yeah. Uh, do you know I call degradation? I call the degradation is very, very severe. Just two milligram per cubic meter less than uh, an airplane can f fly uh, to me two milligram per cubic meter. So it requires uh, very, very high sensitive cameras. So uh, how do you achieve this uh, high sensitive camera requirement? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, how, how, uh, how, how will you uh, achieve that high, sensi high sensi sensitivity for camera? Well, uh, the sensor we are using, uh, it's built in uh, five, uh, 15 micrometer uh, technology, so it should already have quite a, re a really low, uh, really high, s sorry, signal to noise ratio. So, uh, but the other fact is that we don't really need, uh, this is not the highest importance to have really, let's say, um, calibrated radiance for us. For us, it's just important that we, ha that we recognize some texture of the cloud in both images, and uh, this doesn't really have to be in the same, I mean, it doesn't have to be converted to radiance at, at all. It can be just digital numbers that we then correlate, I mean, it's just an automatic image imaging, uh, image matching, sorry. So we can, we need just some kind of values, uh, and for that we don't really need to convert this, for example, to radiance. For that, we don't uh, really need so high signal-to-noise ratio. 
Just one question, your thermal infrared camera, uh, I see the resolution is only 1.5 kilometers. Is that sufficient for measuring the cloud heights uh, to uh, good enough accuracy? Let, let's say it like this. In this study over here, I was using a combination of uh, geostationary and polar orbiting satellites. Geostationary satellites have uh, in the visible spectrum also about one kilometer resolution if they are if they are looking into Nadir, so on the equator. If you look at Iceland, they have something like three kilometer resolution. And using those satellites, I was able to estimate the height of about uh, something like 600 meters without using sub-pixel image match. If we go into the sub-pixel analysis, we will be certainly able to uh, use also 1,500 meter resolution data. So that's that's the pixel resolution, the so 1,500. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.